Then, and I got a text message from my wife that said, come please, man, in the store. Why, the text didn't even get to my phone before I was in the store. And I was looking for anything that was moving in sight. And when I saw my wife, I saw a man, tall and huge, right by her. And she just looked at him, and I said, sir, can I help you? He's looking at me. I said, sir, can I help you? Is, is there a problem? Because I, I noticed that you're, you're a little bit too close. Oh, this is your wife. Yes, this is my wife. Then he backs up. He was trying to make an indecent ap uh, uh, approach to the queen. And a man like that, sometimes, you know what happened in Esther's day. You know. <laughs> my brothers and sisters, do you know that Jesus himself is protective of his church? He loves you. And he that touches the church touches the apple of the eye of Christ. Now, if you touch Christ, he may not do anything to you. But if he touches his church, he's going to let you know. He's a protector. And when that happens, a church can feel safe in his presence. I say, praise God, that we have a protector. Isn't it a wonderful thing to have a protector? Now, someone says, well, 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 were you going to kill him? No, I wasn't going to kill him. I was going to subdue him. <laughs> now, the Bible, the Bible says subdue. <laughs> and I was going to subdue him. And if he needed more help, I would help him. Amen. <laughs> but by the grace of God, God says, you know, somebody said, well, well, where are you going to pray? Yes, but the Bible says, inspiration says, he who does nothing but pray will soon cease to pray. You pray and work. I'm not telling you to be ungodly. I'm telling you that God wants some protectors of his church. And I'm going to tell you something. God wants us to protect our young people. I look at these young men that are here. These are precious young men. I see young brothers in the back. I've seen these young brothers grow up. I feel like I'm their uncle. <laughs> and if I see some snot rolling down their nose, I'm going to wipe it off. Whether it's real snot or whether it's snot from the heart. You, you mucus, you understand. But I know that these young men here, these young men and families here, I believe that God is putting together a team that's going to finish the work. I want to be a part of that team. And I, I don't know about you, but I cannot close my eyes. I don't know how some ministers can do it, but I can't see a young person talking or an adult talking, walking up in the room, just passing back and forth when God will not allow it in heaven. We have lost a sense of God's presence and dare a minister to say something about it. My brothers and sisters, we don't know what it means to be in God's presence anymore. To be in God's presence, and you, can you imagine a generation chewing gum? Talking on cell phones. I mean, you be in the back talking on the cell phone in the church, in God's presence. My brothers and sisters, the mercy of God that we're not consumed. We should be praying when we enter God's presence, it should be with the greatest joy of knowing that we're getting ready to talk to the one who loves us, the one who cares about us, the one who's interested in our salvation, the one who died. I mean, his hands were nailed to the cross for you and for me. I think it's a serious thing. You know that if we're lost, it will break the heart of God. You know that it won't be fun for God to dispense judgment. It's not fun to God. God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, not one. And so my brothers and my sisters, if we're lost, we will be used to break God's heart. And why would we want to break the heart of one whose heart was already broken for us on Calvary? Breaking for us every day. But there's something that we can do to cheer his heart. You know what the greatest thing we can do right now? Give our heart to God. Someone said, I already gave it. Well, no, you've got to give it to him every day. It's a moment by moment, God wants your heart. And so my brothers and sisters, as we get ready to go deeper into our study today, I want to make sure that you're aware this is not an ordinary time. I would rather, if you're so convinced that you just have to be distracted or talk, do you know that you could leave this ground? Do you know that God would rather have one person here that's serious than to have a church that is full, but nobody really serious about God? My brothers and sisters, God is looking for an army that he can train, someone that's willing to follow him. But the question is, do you really believe? Now, go to the book of Luke. What book did I say? We're going to the book of Luke chapter 9. We were noticing something last night. We want to begin to notice it again tonight. We have some ground to cover. Are you ready to study? In the book of Luke chapter 9, notice what the Bible says. In Luke chapter 9, we want to notice the words of Christ, and we want to pay close attention. We'll read this 
again and again as God uh, leads us, and we want to understand something very interesting. Now, our screen, we showed you a slide last night. What does the slide say? What does the screen say? What does it say? 2020 is what? No ordinary year. Now, my brothers and sisters, 2020 was very prophetic. We spoke of it last night. 2020 itself was prophetic. But every year, as we continue to study, we're going to see that God allows is going to get worse and worse. It's going to get tragic. It's not going to get better. Someone says, well, I can't wait to go back to normal. We will never go back to normal. This is a new normal. And every year, it's going to get worse and worse until the passing of a son in law in a time of trouble, says so it never was. And the only time that is going to relent its troublesomeness is when Jesus comes through the sky. And if that is the case, and we're not keeping up with the footmen right now, how are we going to deal with the horses? And if we can't keep up with the horses, how are we going to deal in the swelling of the Jordan? The Bible tells us that if ever there was a time, and I'm going to tell you something, the, 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 the greatest thing that we can do, the greatest thing, the marker, the greatest thing that we can do, please, thank you. And you appreciate this larger board, amen? We can thank uh, Elder Bridges for that board. <laughs> you don't have to pretend tonight. What is the greatest thing that we can do right now? Would you read it for me? What does it say? I put an exclamation point there. Greatest thing we can do right now is become the friend of God. There's nothing greater than that. I don't care how deep you go in the Bible. I don't care how wide and much you study. When you get down to the bottom line, the nitty gritty, the re reality is that what we need is to become the friend of God. Are you God's friend? Are you God's friend? Someone says, well, I'm God's friend. Do you know that if you're God's friend, you're interested in what God thinks? No, you have a friend, you're interested in what the friend thinks. You, you talk to your friend, you, you put some clothes on. And, um, whether you're in the world or you're not in the world, you, anybody can associate. They, they have somebody they think is a friend, they put on some clothes. Man, how I look? You, you think it looks okay? Yeah. <laughs> Now, in their mind, they may have thought they looked good or not, but they want to hear some confirmation from their friend. And I was getting ready to go ahead. You, you come here, what, what you think? You, you're interested in what the friend thinks. When you didn't know no better and you were trying to talk to that young lady or that young man, man, how do you think she looked? You, you thought something already, but you think she looked okay? <laughs> you're interested in what your friend thinks. If we, can, if we don't care about what God thinks, it's an indication that we're not God's friend. Friends care about each other. Friends don't want to hurt each other. If a man will hurt you, he's not a friend. You got another brother and another brother will, will hurt you, he's not your friend. You see, my brothers and sisters, someone who is your friend is interested in your well-being, your welfare. And God wants to be our friend. And the greatest thing in the world is to become the friend of God. Do you want to be his friend, yes or no? And my brothers and sisters, 2020, no ordinary year, our great goal should be I want to become the friend of God. That's our goal. Now, last night you told me you want your eyes open. We're in 2020, we know 2021, we don't have much time. My question is, do you still want your eyes open or is that just last night? You want to open tonight. Remember I gave you a selection of some pills. Which one you want? Now, if you wanted the blue pill, I'll tell you you got to go home. I don't serve blue pills. You want a red pill? All right. You want the red pill? You want your eyes open? You want to understand? Inspiration tells us something very important. Inspiration says, it is your privilege to be endowed from the day to day with a rich measure of his what? We need the rain, the Holy Spirit. And to have broadened views of the importance and what else? Scope of the message we are proclaiming to the world. We have a message that is like none other. There is no denomination that has a message like ours. There is no people that have a message like ours, and the devil's intent upon making us hate the message because he knows that if we ever grab hold of it, we have something to tell the world. It says, the Lord is willing to reveal to you wondrous things out of his what? Law. Wait before him with humility of heart. Let's read this together. Pray. We're talking about prayer earlier today. It says, pray most what? Earnestly. For what? What should we be praying about? It says, pray more earnestly for an understanding 
of the times in which we live. Well, what year are we in? So what should we be praying for? I want to understand 2021. I want to understand the time in which we live. It says, for a fuller conception of his purpose and for increase in efficiency and what? We should be praying, Lord, make us workers. How can we win souls on these grounds? We should be watching. Is there some other soul I can win? Is there someone I can encourage? Is there someone I can pray with? Somebody's discouraged. Some family member is getting ready to give up. Some home is getting ready to turn back. You never know that when somebody comes here as the last, I remember seeing a man coming to this camp meeting. He didn't make it back the next camp meeting because he was dead. We take for granted that we're going to see each other every year. We take for granted that we're going to live tomorrow and the next. But this is not certain, brothers and sisters. The only thing that is certain is God. And I want to have an experience with that God and praying for increased understanding and efficiency and soul winning. And in order to understand the time, God wants us to learn how to start thinking. To start what? Now, we said something last night about thinking men. Remember that? We read a quotation. We're going to read again and again. Every time, more to be looked at. Now, here's a man by the name of Peter Turkin. You ever heard of that man before? Peter Turkin. Is he a preacher? No. Turkin is a Russian-American scientist specializing in cultural evolution. He's a mathematical modeling statistical analyst, and he has dynamics on historical societies. What this is saying is that this man, he's a mathematician, but he's also a history uh, a, 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 a teacher, student, researcher. And he studies through history, and he looks at the years of history. And he then puts in the history, put it on a mathematical uh, scale. And you know that right now that, that, that everything has a mathematical precision. And then he's able to be able to start uh, 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 looking at and predicting what type of social cultural patterns take place in society based on hundreds of hundreds of years of historical uh, data. And he puts it in. This man is a, name by, by a man by the name of Jack Goldstein. American sociologist, political scientist, historian specializing in studies on special movements. What's his specialty? Talk to me. Revolutions. He has studied what causes revolution, the purpose of a revolution, the interest of a revolution, the, 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 the reasons for a revolution, and he studies how they come about, when they take place, how long they last, what the issues are. Man, this man went to Harvard. School so many idolize as the so-called great school. Now, the prophet says the present is a time of overwhelming interest to all living. Rulers and statesmen, men who occupy positions of trust and authority. What type of men? Thinking men and women of how many classes have their attention affixed upon the events that are taking place all about us. While you're looking at it and should be praying about it, thinking men are already looking at it as well. They look at the events. They look at the restless conditions that exist among the nations. It says they observe the intensity that is taking possession of how many earthly elements. And they recognize by looking at events, by looking at nations, by looking at earthly elements, looking at how the tensions are rising among the nations. And they recognize by what they see that something great and decisive is about to take place, not in the far future, but in the imminent near future. And it says that the world is on the verge of what type of a crisis? A stupendous crisis. Now, these men don't have to study the Bible to see that they're looking at the events, they're looking at nations, and they recognize some things. Now, my brothers and sisters, these men have noticed something. This says in 2020, is the United States on the brink of what? Another civil war. Now, you and I have studied year by year, and we've looked at the quotations from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy that proves to us that there will be another civil war. Did we not look at those statements, yes or no? We've seen it. This man asked this question. This uh, article in 2020 came out, and it says, this model forecasts the U.S. current unrest how long? Now, how long is a decade? How long is that? Ten years. So here's 2020, but in 2010, these students, the same two men that I showed you. They were studying history and science, mathematics, and they were putting something in. In fact, it said in the early 1990s, when Bill Clinton was in the White House, you remember Bill Clinton, you remember that, don't you? And the United States looked how? 
Now, what was one thing that made the United States look unshakable in 1990? Anybody remember 1990? What was one thing that made the United States look unshakable in 1990? Because if you were to go back to 1985, they didn't look so unshakable. In 1989, the world power called Russia, the superpower, failed. Berlin Wall came crumbling down, that superpower that was against America. Because see, everything America had, Russia had. They were toe-to-toe. But in 1990, after Russia fell, it left America the sole remaining superpower, and it looked as if nobody could touch America for the first time in history. America was at its top. And it says, the administration appointed who? Jack Goldstein, that's the man we just talked about. To study how states fail. Now, they weren't talking about America. They were talking about, look at all these other nations that failed, like Russia and others. And they were to study it and find out what made the nation so great, so strong, what made it collapse, what made the society break down, what made revolutions. They meant what other states, not the U.S., few expected that his model would later predict their own country's what? Collapse. That's amazing. So they were studying all the information that all the other nations But then the man said, well, if we studied all these other nations, what if we apply this data to the United States of what? America. And they did so. Watch what happened. It says in an unpublished paper submitted by peer review, Goldstein, who was a sociologist, and Peter Turkin, an expert in mathematical modeling of historical societies, have concluded that the U.S. is headed for what? Another what? Civil war. Now, it's amazing that the men who think and just look at events of history can look and say it's about to happen. Why? Because time is circular. As it have been, so shall it be. There's nothing what? New under the sun. History repeats itself. It says the conditions for civil violence, they say, are the worst since the 19th century. In particular, the years leading up to the start of the American Civil War in what year? So what these men did, they went back to history. They went back to the 1700s and the 1800s, and they looked at all the models, what was there, what was happening in society, politically, economically, socially. Then they took all the information, how long it took between the years, all that, and they predicted it, and then they they took all the information and put it in the supercomputer. They then played it out, and they were able to lay it down on history and predict the Civil War and showed that they could have predicted the Civil War in 1861 based on what was happening in uh, 1700 and 1800 based on the same model. So the men said, well, if it can go backwards and prove to be correct, what would happen if we take the model and then make it look what? Forward. And when they did that, it shocked their minds. Professor Goldstein is leading authority on the, he's a leading authority on the study of what? Revolutions and long-term social change. They applied to to U.S. history. It predicted the 1861 Civil War in the past and the unrest of the 1930s. Ten years ago, Professor Turkin pointed his model towards the what? Future. And made an uncannily accurate prediction. Just like in the 1850s crisis, indicators were rising that led to the Civil War. He wrote in his journal, uh, the Journal of Nature in 2010, he wrote, let's read this together, they could be a what? Reliable indicator of looming instability and look set to peak in the years around what? This man said in 2020, based on what this model shows us that went backwards and was correct, he said we should see in 2020 the beginning of a great crisis. I want to ask you a question. You know that when he wrote that in 2010, they didn't believe him. They laughed at him. In America? No. In 2020, guess what they did? They dug back up the journal of nature, and they said, wait a minute, 10 years ago, this man said that. They had been studying since the 90s. You know what they did? After they did that, they went, and the reporters found him, and looked back at the report and said, how in the world could you know that? Because while everybody else said they said was surprised by COVID in 2020, they said, you accurately identified it before. And he said, yes. In fact, he said, I I knew it was going to happen. Now, watch what the prophet says. Soon, grievous troubles will what? I'm going to tell you, if the prophet were alive today, she wouldn't say that. You know what the prophet would say with this quotation? Grievous troubles have already arisen. Trouble that will not what? Cease until Jesus comes. That what began in 2020 will not stop until Jesus comes. 
And my brothers and my sisters, inspiration is trying to get us prepared for this because this man said, if I'm still right, he said, you will know that by 2025, you will see something worse than 2020. Now, my brothers and sisters, these thinking men from every field of knowledge begin to start talking about the exact same thing, and they say how America will collapse by what? 2025. Now, and then I asked last night a question. Do you really believe? See, if you and I really believe that we have just a few short years at the most before a crisis such as this that will test our relationship with God, our relationship with each other, and our relationship with life, if we believe this, it has to work some type of change in what we're doing right now, either for good or for bad. And brothers and sisters, God wants it for good. God wants us to actually look. Go into your Bible to Luke chapter 9, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. You're there, amen? Luke chapter 9, notice what the Bible says in Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 43. I want to read the words of Jesus again. Luke 9, beginning in verse 43. Would you read that with me? What does the Bible say? And they were all amazed at the mighty power of God. But while they wondered, every one at all things which Jesus did, he said, where? Unto what? He said unto his disciples. Now, can you imagine? Jesus is looking at the multitude, but he said something to his disciples. He said something to his disciples. And he said to his disciples, in verse 44, Let these sayings, let's read this together, do what? Sink down into your ears. What do you think he meant when he said that? Let these things sink, sink down into your ears. What do you think he was saying? Don't let it just flow over the top of your head. Let it saturate you. Let it get your attention. Don't let the words that I say come in one ear and out the other. Let it sink down deep into the mind, deep into the heart. Because I'm telling you something, and what Jesus said, I want to say something similar. What I tell you, don't, don't let it slip over you. What number did I write on the board? And what did I put over here? A little more or a little less? My brothers and sisters, listen to me. It would take a miracle, a miracle, a divine miracle, to make America last into 2025 without collapsing. And what we have to do now is go back to the Bible because we're going to find out that God is trying to move us to a particular place. Can you imagine right now? God wants to move us to a place where we are the friend of what? We're the friend of God. But right now, we're not there. You know where we are right now? Right now, we are what? Enemies. That's where we are right now. How do I know we're enemies? The Bible says, love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. If we love the world, the love of the Father is what? It's not maybe in us. It's not in us. He's not condemning us by that. He's just telling us it's not there. If you say it's there, you're a liar. You cannot love world and Christ. Why? Because any man that loves the world is an enemy of God. James 4.4. 4. So if I love the world, now someone says, well, well, what do you mean? Listen, do you know that right now, if, the, if a person today will spend hours on cell phones and hours in television and hours talking to this girl or this guy, hours, and when he comes to church, he's not interested in the Bible or God or the truth or redemption. That man cannot be a friend of God. He has to be an enemy. Now, my brothers and my sisters, when we look at something like this, God is trying to tell us, I want to show you your true, 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 true condition. I want to know my true condition. He wants us to understand ourselves because God can never, listen carefully to me, God can never comfort us without first convicting us. You ever been to a church before and all of a sudden the music is playing and the, and the people are excited and they're jumping up and they say, whoo, we had church today. And everybody just running up, yeah, we had church today. Do you know that the first thing I know is that the Holy Spirit was not there. You will not leave church like that if the Holy Spirit is there. I know it because I know the work of the Holy Spirit. You know what the first work of the Holy Spirit is when you read the Bible? You know what the first work of the Holy Spirit is? He's not a comforter first. Jesus will never comfort you first. I don't care how much you long for a comforter, he will never comfort you first. First, he's going to make you cry. You know what the Bible says? Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. 
Not everybody, the ones that mourn, the ones that cry, not just about somebody else, not cry because they can't watch television, but cry because they have watched it. Not cry because they can't go to the theater or to party, but crying because they have been partying and they've forgotten about Jesus. My brothers and sisters, God is trying to tell us he wants us to see ourselves and cry, but if we cry to God, he won't leave us there crying. He will wipe the tear from our eyes. When we leave church, God wants us to leave, not like the Pharisee, but like the publican. You know the publican? You know how he came? He said, Father, God, be what? Merciful to me, a sinner. I'm wretched. I'm miserable. I'm poor. Lord, my family, we can't make it. There's no way. Once a man comes to the condition where he recognizes, I cannot make it. Then God says, now I can take you. Now I can make you a fisher of men. My brothers and sisters, God is interested right now today in letting this truth sink deep into our ears. I'm going to tell you something. 99% of us, and I leave a room for 1%, but 99% of us, if we're honest with ourselves, we will know that we really don't believe. We don't believe. There's no way that we can continue week after week, year after year, if we really believe. Now, my brothers and sisters, this week, I want God to change us from unbelief to belief. Do you want that? I want that for myself. Sometimes we make our children not believe. You say, what do I mean? You know, sometimes we'll, we, you, you share a message like this, and after church, or after a meeting like this, you go talk to the child. You don't know what to say to the child. You're nervous. And so you go over to the child, and you say, what are you going to be when you grow up? You know what your question suggests? You don't believe. What are you going to be when you grow up? What do you mean? I mean, if you would have asked Noah, what are you getting ready for? What are you going to make your child? He's going to say, I'm going to make him an ark builder so that we get on board that ark. The only thing on his mind was the mission that God put upon his heart, the mission of his family. Now, my brothers and sisters, sometimes unbeknownst to us, we don't mean it, but we go and we, 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 we show things like this and we all, oh, well, yeah, yeah, when you come back this year, a few years from now, we'll do this a few years from now, but we're not really thinking that next year a crisis can break. And you're waiting for 10 years and 20 years and 30 years. Can you imagine what it would be like if, if you heard revolution just took place in the city you just came from and that you could not go back into the city of where you were, and all your things were there, nothing was there, your family was there, how would you feel? You're saying, this is just what I talked about. See, there's going to come a time when everything that you've heard, instead of it just simply slowly down coming, is going to rapidly hit us, but inspiration says it's going to come with blinding force. Then you're going to respond and say, well, I, 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 I wish, I remember we were in New York just before 2020 hit. Some of you were there. And we were doing a meeting in 2019, and I wrote on the board, not 2025, you know what I wrote on the board? 2020. And in New York City, I'm telling you, if you, you've been in New York City, uh, you, let, me, let me see your hand, those who've been in New York City. Let me see your hand. Yeah, 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 no, no, Brother Paul would never been in New York City. <laughs> but I remember I walked out, I remember going through uh, one of the gates, and when I saw a man going into the Bronx, all the boroughs, in front, going in the, 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 the interstate, I saw a big gate. And I'm thinking, what in the world is that big gate for? Can you imagine a crisis hit, the gate shuts? No one goes in, no one comes out. Now, my brothers and my sisters, we were there in 2019. I said to them, I said, listen, the crisis of no ordinary year will begin next year. At another point, someone said, well, uh, 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 I just have a question. Are you time setting? Now, now nobody in New York asks us if we're time setting now. They saw what happened in 2020. Some of those same ones that, that, that were asking about it, some of those same ones couldn't leave their house. They had to have soldiers and guards bring food to them. Can you imagine if that was it and there was no more time of mercy, how you would have felt to say, I sat in a meeting with a man of God, the minister, and we would see, if we look back, it wasn't really the minister, an angel standing beside the desk saying, please get ready. Touching the hearts of children, touching the hearts of adults, families, saying, I don't want you to be lost. I want you to be saved. 
Can you imagine what it would be like and it would be too late to ever get ready? You will look back on this. You know the prophet said in early writings? He said that she saw God showed her the seven last plagues. And she saw men screaming and, 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 and biting and chewing, as it were, gnawing, as Revelation 16 points out. And then she said she heard a group howling louder above every other group. And the prophet said, who are they? What's that? And the angel of God told her, these were former Sabbath keepers, former seven at Venice, who lost their way. Can you imagine what it would be like to have all this precious opportunity, but have wasted or nothing? If we're lost, what do we gain? What should it profit a man to gain the whole world and to lose his soul? My brothers and sisters, I believe with this head of mine, this loose, weak, feeble mind of mine, that with all the evidence, it points to the fact that we have just a few short years at the most, plus or minus. I don't even know if we can make it to 2025. I'm praying, Lord, please. But my brothers and sisters, the greatest thing we can do right now is do what? The greatest thing we can do right now is actually to make the exodus. Thomas, I thought you said the greatest thing, the greatest thing would be the friend of God. I did. But you're going to find out that these two things go hand in hand. In order to be the friend of God, you must make the exodus. In order to make the exodus, you must be the friend of God. It's circular. And I don't know about you, but I want to make that exodus. Now, before we get ready to get deep into our study, inspiration says, there are many in the church who at heart do what? Belong to the world. But God calls upon those who claim to believe the advanced truth, that's us, to rise above the present attitude of the popular churches of today. Where is the self-denial? Where is the cross-bearing that Christ has said to characterize his followers? Let's read this together. The reason we have had so little influence upon what unbelieving relatives and associates is. Wouldn't it be interesting to find out what the prophet said? Someone said, well, I wonder what it is. It's because I haven't. It's because I haven't. I wonder what the prophet says. Wouldn't you want to reach your unbelieving wife or your unbelieving husband or your unbelieving child or your unbelieving parent? Wouldn't you want to reach the unbelieving friend or the unbelieving in the world? What is the greatest thing that I can do? You see, I'm going to tell you something. You and I can't touch people who don't believe if we don't believe. It's like a sleeping man trying to wake up a sleeping wife. He can't do it. It says, the reason we have so little influence upon unbelieving relatives and associates is that we have manifested what? Little decided difference in our practices from those of the world. We're no different. Now, why is it that we're in love with worldly music or worldly food or worldly dress? Why is it? Because we're not a friend of God. A man that is a friend of the world is the enemy of God. And if we are friends of God, we're enemies of the world. We don't love it. We love Jesus. Parents need to not go to sleep, but what? Awake and purify their souls, not just by talking, but by what? Practicing the truth where this is one of the things that's killing families. They see the adults say one thing at church and at meeting, but at home they do something totally different. My brothers and sisters, if we're real and we really believe, they must see a difference in when no one else is there in private. Now, I want you to do something. Now, if your children are here, it's not going to work on you because they're going to know, know what I'm telling you. But if you want to test your experience in the middle of the day, just take out your Bible and start reading. Now, the average child, if they were to walk in their house, they just see their, their, their parents just in the middle of the day, not because they're doing the Bible study or preparing for a Bible study. They, they, they just get on their knees and take out the Bible and read. You know what the child would do? The child come in. Uh, mother, father, is everything all right? Did anybody die? It's almost foreign. Every time we do something, you know, the devil tries to make happen. And I said, Lord, these happen. You know, you, you go inside there. The moment you do it, somebody, we have our things all over the place. When you wake up, it's almost as if the cell phone has to be within the arm reach of you. It's almost like when you, you go somewhere, how can I take this with me? God wants to start changing our minds, changing our hearts, changing our affections. 
changing, not just in public, but the practices in the home life. When we reach the standard that the Lord would have us reach, worldlings will regard what? Seventh-day Adventists as what? Odd, singular, straight lace extremists. You afraid of that? Don't say, I don't like to be called names. I like to just fit in. Well, my brothers and sisters, we will never fit in if we follow Jesus. But God doesn't want us to fit in because he needs some signs that will point to a better life. I want to point to Jesus. What do you say? So my brothers and sisters, we are going to be made spectacle unto the world, unto angels, unto men, but it's going to take somebody who believes like Noah believed. How many other families do you read about that were building the ark like Noah was building? Did anybody ever join them? Some of them joined them. But my brothers and sisters, you'll find out that the majority of the world were busy buying and selling, planning and building, that they had no time to build the ark. They had a lot of things to do, but not get ready. My question is, do you and I really believe? Do you want to believe, yes or no? We're going to show you that no belief. Interesting tells us we only half believe the word of God. A man will act out all the faith that he has. That's what the prophet says. First Lectures 93. So if I believe it, I'll act it out. If I don't act it out, what does it tell me? I don't believe. What are you carrying out in your home life, in your heart, my heart, in your family, with your wife, with your children, with your parents, with your friends? When no one else is there, no adult, what are you doing? You see, while we may fool everybody else, we don't fool God. We can't pretend God is looking for a real relationship. I want to give him what's real. He bought it. I want to give him what he paid for. So my brothers and sisters, we're going to stop right here, and we'll get ready to go into our study. But before we do, I've got to do what a teacher does. And I want to at least pretend to be a teacher, even if I'm not. So let me go back, and you know, a teacher gives you a quiz. I'm going to give you a quiz. You ready for the quiz? Here's a quiz. What is the name of this series called that we're studying together this week? I didn't hear you. What did you say? The Adventist home and the, the final exodus. You know, this is part of the exodus. He wants to take us from being the enemy of God and exiting to become the friend of God. It includes physical and spiritual things. All right? To make the exodus, we found out one thing that we would need last night. Anybody remember what it was? If we're going to make the exodus, what do we need? Praise the Lord. Spirit of urgency. No one will make the exodus without the spirit of urgency. Three, what was the name of the message last night? Do you really believe? What is the name of the message tonight? Do you really believe? <laughs> what will be the message tomorrow night? Well, we don't know yet, but we'll see. <laughs> what is our true condition? Somebody said, oh, here we go again. What's our true condition? Now, in order to be free, we have to make the exodus. No one who didn't make the exodus were ever free. They died in the water. But those who make the exodus, they become free. Now, brothers and sisters, we're going to find that they needed something in order to make the exodus. You know what they needed to make the exodus? I'm going to start and finish right here. You know what they needed to make the exodus? They needed something. What did they need to make the exodus? A man. They needed a what? Did God prepare a man to lead the exodus, yes or no? God prepared a man. How long did it take him to prepare that man? Eighty years. <laughs> First 40, gave him a foundation. Next 40, put him in a position to do the work. Now, my brothers and sisters, that man Moses led them out of Egypt. Am I right? But that's not the man I'm talking about. That man's dead. There's another man that's dead, but he's alive again. Just like that other Moses, he died and was resurrected and brought to heaven. This Moses I'm talking about, this man I'm talking about is a man by the name of Jesus. In order to make the exodus, we need Jesus. We need him in our hearts. We need him in our homes. We need him in our ministry. We need him in our church. And when he is there, the work will be finished. You know, Laodicea, where is Jesus when Laodicea in the last church? Where is Jesus? 
He's not inside. He's trying to get inside. Brothers and sisters, we don't have long to learn how to open the door so that Jesus can come in. I want to learn. What do you say? Let's stop and pray. Heavenly Father, we have never been in a time in which we're in tonight. And we need you, dear God. We need thy son, Jesus Christ, like never before. We need the presence and the power of your Holy Spirit. We need you, Lord, to convince us of our condition so that you can bring us out of the condition of being your enemy to becoming your friend. We want to learn, Lord, in our own hearts how to walk with Jesus. And so, Father, as we begin to study some more to the question, do I really believe? I plead that you will convict our hearts. I pray not yet for comfort, Lord. I pray for conviction first. Because a man cannot truly be comforted until he's convicted, until he's made to mourn. And then that same of us that mourn, we shall have our sorrow turned into joy. Do this for me. Do it for my family. Do it for the families assembled here through the internet. Who all is watching, Lord, help us to see that we're in trouble. But then show us that we have a Savior that will come in trouble. A present help in trouble. Lord, we need you right now. Abide with us. Remove every distraction. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll take your Bibles, we want to turn back to the book of Exodus where we left off last night. Exodus chapter 12. What book did I say? We're going back to Exodus chapter 12. I think that it becomes very evident that you and I are standing tonight on the threshold of great and solemn events. We can see just by watching, whether it's the news, whether it's uh, the internet, whether it's the newspaper, whatever means of media that shows us what's going on in human affair, no matter which way we turn, we can see with our own eyes that prophecy is rapidly being fulfilled right before our very eyes, and God has given us the ability to know where we are in the stream of time for a particular reason. He's allowed us to understand the intricacies, the details, the understanding of human affairs and world events. Why? Because he wants to develop inside of us the spirit of urgency. My brothers and sisters, the entire Bible is built on that spirit of urgency. Jesus himself. In fact, nobody was more urgent in all the Bible than Jesus Christ himself. Am I right or wrong? You remember, listen to how Jesus talked. Jesus doesn't talk like you're not today. You know, you can get ready anytime you want. He said, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of heaven is not far. It's at what? Hand. He said to John, as John is getting ready to baptize him, he said, suffer it to be so. Not tomorrow. Suffer it to be so when? Now. He said to Judas, whatever you do, don't just say, don't take a long time. Whatever you do, do what? Quickly. He said, I must work the works within the semi while it is day. Why? The night cometh when no man can work. Jesus was urgent, and no one can become like Jesus without having the spirit of urgency. Now, I want you to know that you're on safe Bible grounds when you embrace the spirit, but not a fake urgency, not a surface urgency, not an ignorant urgency. You know, sometimes a bird can fall off the uh, the sky, and someone says, oh, bird fall out of the sky. No, let's get ready. Time of trouble is here. What does a bird fall out of the sky mean, the time of trouble is here? How does it mean that? There is an intelligent urgency that God wants us to have. Jesus said, whoso readeth, let him what? Understand. God wants to speak not just to the emotion. He wants the mind to think. Come now, let us what? Reason together. He wants the mind to think and understand that no matter what everyone else says, that you and I really believe. And if we believe, we we don't care what anyone else is doing. Let me tell you something. If you really believe what Christ was here and you wanted to be alive, you would go to the place where life is. If we really believe what we're studying this week, that means that we cannot leave the way we came. There has to be a change. There has to be a change in the way we spend our time, the way we spend our money, how we deal with our family. There has to be a change. We cannot continue with this no good, careless, easygoing, comfortable, complacent experience. There must be a spirit of urgency. Now, my brothers and sisters, we found out that the Exodus was made in this spirit. Where in the Bible did we notice that the Exodus was an urgent time? That in order to make the Exodus, the Bible in type showed us that we had to be urgent. Where in the Bible did we see that in Exodus 12? Anybody remember? Anybody remember? Let's read it. Exodus 12, verse 11. And it's in 33 too. Verse 11. Look what the Bible says in verse 11. Let's pick up there again. Exodus 12, verse 11. You're there, amen? 
Let's read that together. What does the Bible say in verse 11? The Bible says, And thus shall you eat with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. Not in slow motion. Eat it how? In haste. What does it mean to hasten? What does it mean to move in haste? It means to move not slowly, but we must step fast. Now, my brothers and sisters, to make the exodus, they had to move quickly. The Bible says they must uh, eat in the haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Now, what article of food suggests that they had to eat in haste? Unleavened bread. You know that it was not accident that God gave them unleavened bread. Do you, do you know why the bread was unleavened? Someone said, well, they just didn't like leaven. <laughs> no, that's not why. Why was it unleavened bread? Look what the Bible says. Look, look, Exodus 12. Look at Exodus 12. Look in verse 33. Look what the Bible says in verse 33. The Bible says, and the Egyptians were, what? Urgent. I mean, when you get urgent, you will even make a non-believer become urgent. These were pagan Egyptians. But they move with the same urgency that the people of God move with. When you get urgent, the world will get urgent right beside you. You see, you're trying to make the world urgent and get ready, but you're not getting ready. I'm not getting ready. And as a result, we can't make the world believe what we don't believe ourselves. And so God says, first you get urgent, the Egyptians will follow. Look what the Bible says. And the Egyptians were urgent upon the people that they might send them what? Out of the land. How? In haste. For they said, we be all dead men. Verse 34. And the people took their dough before it was what? Why? Their kneading troughs being bound up in their clothes upon their shoulders. They were already packed up. They didn't have anything to knead the, the, the dough with. They, all their instruments, their leaven, the dough, they didn't have time for the rising. You know it takes time to make bread rise. You know that? But they didn't have time for that. They said, those who want their bread to rise, you will die in Egypt. And if you think and I think that I can get out of sin and take my time. I want to do it one more time. Can you imagine a man? This is how the devil speaks to you. Jesus is so merciful, you can sin just one more. Watch it just one more time. Yeah, you give it up. Nobody knows about it, but just watch it one more time. And then get rid of it. Eat it just one more time. Think about it just one more time. Do it just one more. Didn't it feel so good, taste so good, sound so good? Isn't it all right? You can have it just one more time and then go back to God. But my brothers and sisters, nothing assures us we'll ever get back to God. There must be a spirit of urgency when we look at sin. To say, Father, I cannot afford to play with sin. I must get out of it immediately. And we can't get out of it by ourselves, but we can go to the man and say, Dear God, tonight I want help from Jesus Christ. Tonight I will no longer touch that filthy thing. Tonight there will be no difference. Tonight there's got to be a change. And so my brothers and sisters, they had a spirit of urgency about them. Did the prophet tell us that we need that same spirit, yes or no? Inspiration tells us, very carefully, inspiration tells us, it says, I see the necessity of the making what? Haste. To get not some things ready, but how many things? So everything we do, all the things that we do, should never be in slow motion. We should be making haste. Are you doing devotion? Morning and evening with God? Someone says, well, I do it sometimes. You know, we need to be in haste to say, well, if I'm not doing it all the time, I need to start right now. My brothers and sisters, it says, Mark how all through the word of God, there is manifest what? The spirit of what? Urgency. So my brothers and sisters, can we make the exodus biblically without being urgent? Yes or no? So then what's the question? What will produce intelligence intelligently in us urgency? What will do that? What must happen to us to produce an intelligent spirit of urgency? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, let's turn there, 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Chronicles, excuse me, 1 Chronicles 12. Notice what the Bible says, and 1 Chronicles 12, what will produce the true intelligent spirit of urgency so that we can make this exodus? 1 Chronicles chapter 12, and when you get there, please let me know by saying amen. 1 Chronicles 12, when you get there, let me know by saying amen. You're there, amen? Look what the Bible says in verse 32. In 1 Chronicles 12, beginning in verse 32, let's read that together. What does the Bible say? It says, and of the children of what? Issachar, which were men that had not ignorance, but what? Understanding of the what? 
Where did the prophet say we should be praying for earnestly right now? Lord, help me to understand the time. That was that prayer. It says we must understand time. Why? What for? What will this understanding of the time do for us? The Bible says that men might have understanding of the time to know what Israel ought to what. And what we ought to do is to embrace the spirit of urgency. Now, that means in order to have this urgent spirit and know exactly what we to do in this crisis, we must understand time. Now, we know that there's a limit. We studied that before. But my brothers and sisters, we found that in order to really understand time, you cannot go to the future to understand time in its fullness. Where must I go to really understand time as a whole? Somebody tell me where I must go. I've got to go to the past. The past is sometimes more significant than the present. The past is sometimes more significant than the future. The past is where the problems started and where the solutions still lie. Somebody said, what do you mean? This is what Jesus meant when he was talking to the first church. He says, remember therefore from whence thou hast fallen. Repent. Now, in order to repent, we have to first look what? Not forward. We have to look what? Back. What caused me to be in the condition? What is the history? What is the past? Now, my brothers and sisters, in order to help us to go forward, we've got to go backwards. Now, in our study of the Bible, we found that Ecclesiastes 1 verse 9 told us something very interesting. You know the text. As it hath been, so shall it. There's nothing more than the sun. And then it says, the things that have been are the things that are now. The things that shall be is what is being done. In other words, the present and the future find their blueprint in how the past is carried out. So to understand the present, go to the past. To understand the future, go to the past. What do we need to study tonight? The what? Past. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is what God is trying to take us to because he understands that in order to understand this great clock of time that takes us forward, we first have to go what? Backwards. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is what God is trying to bring us into. Now, we found that the Exodus was what type of an event? A what? What do we mean by timed event? What do we mean by that? It didn't just happen any time. It happened on time. The Exodus that we're in now has to happen on time. Everything that God does is on time. To everything, there's a season and a purpose to every, uh, and a time to every purpose under the heaven. We found out that to understand the time of the Exodus, we've got to study how history works. And we found that history is what? Circular. We found that in Ecclesiastes 1 verse 9. You can look at many texts the same way. We found out that it says the uncontrolled indulgence and con consequent disease and degradation that existed at Christ's what? First advent will again exist with intensity of evil before his what? Second coming. Now, what is this telling us? This is telling us that if you want to understand the second coming, we must first understand the first coming. And we found that the greatest history that will identify the second coming is by understanding what happened at the first coming or first advent of Christ. Now, we begin to look at that and begin to see it start seeing some very interesting things. Did the wise men know about the coming of Christ at the first coming? Yes or no? Were they seven Adventists? Were they thinking men? Yes or no? Did they understand? So we found that what we have to do today is twofold. Go to Matthew chapter 2. Uh, Matthew chapter 2. As we go to the past to understand something about the past, I want us to notice what this says. Now, I'm going to erase this in a moment, so please have that down. But notice what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 2. In Matthew, the second chapter, notice what the Bible says, beginning in verse 1. Here is speaking of the first advent of Jesus. Let's read Matthew 2, verse 1 together. You're there, amen? Let's read verse 1. Now, I was talking to somebody, and they told me today, they said, man, I was studying with you last night, but I got a workout. They said, you're going really fast. They said, can you slow down just a little bit tonight? And I told them, I would. But then I would speed up, amen? <laughs> You see, when you understand how much time is left and what needs to happen to make the exodus, there is in you a spirit of urgency. How can we get in? Because if we go at a slow, a certain, a such a slow pace, we'll never get anywhere. But if we go too fast, we didn't get anything we got. And so we're going to have to bring a, a happy medium and try to speed you up while I slow down. And then we'll be together. Amen? Now, notice what the Bible says in Matthew 2, beginning in verse 1. Let's read that together. Matthew 2 and verse 1. Let's read that. The Bible says... Now, when Jesus was what? This was the first advent of Christ, his first coming. In Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men. What type of men are these? Talk to me. What type of men? Thinking men. It says they came.
from the east to Jerusalem, verse 2, saying, Where is he that is to be born king of the Jews? For we have what? They saw some evidence, and they were asking the church and the political leaders, do you see the evidence that we saw that brought us to this place? Did the political leader know anything about this evidence? No. He came to the church. What did it make the church feel when they looked at the evidence that these thinking men had? What did it make the church feel? Trouble. And all Jerusalem with him. Verse 4, and then what did it say? And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where what? You know what happened? The political leader, did they hear it? He thought that the religious leaders were hiding something because they were acting so ignorant. He said, surely you got to know more than what you're, you're acting like. Show me, tell me. And he demanded, tell me. And then notice what they did in Matthew chapter 2. Notice what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 2. Notice what they did then in verse 5. It says, and they said unto him, what? Let's read this together. In what? Bethlehem of Judea. For thus, what? It is written where? In the prophet. We found that at the first coming of Christ, two things happened. Number one, the thinking men had intelligent evidence of the first advent. Intelligent evidence. In fact, in their history books, if you study history, you'll find out how these men knew that. It was in their history books. They studied it. They had studied philosophy, they had studied history, they had studied science, and they understood about this event, and as a result, they had an intelligent evidence that something great and decisive was about to take place, but they didn't fully understand it. And so God sent them to his church. But guess what the church did? They were troubled. They didn't understand. And then they said, in order to show so if the thinking men were right, they had to go somewhere to confirm if the thinking men were right. Where did they go? Talk to me, somebody. Where did they go? Did they go simply to science? Yes or no? Did they go simply to history and to law? Yes or no? Where did they go? Talk to me. They went to the prophets. So this shows us a blueprint of what we need to do today. When we look at science and history, and when we look at the evidences that show us something great and decisive is about to take place, we should see those intelligent evidences, and then we should take them to the prophets and to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because it is what? No light in them. But if they line up, if the prophets and the thinking men say the same thing, then my brothers and sisters, you've got to be in trouble. It's accurate. And so what we need to do in this journey in making the exodus to have this spirit of urgency, no urgency if we don't understand time. We'll never understand time if we don't understand history. And so we've got to look at some history that will help us to understand what's happening today in 2021. Are you ready to go on this journey with me? Are you ready? All right, put your seatbelt on. Let's get ready to go. Now, let's go forward. It says, how the generational cycles of history explains our current crisis. Going back to history, the prophet tells us, study history. Everything will happen in its order. We saw the thinking men recognizing something great and decisive is about to take place. We saw that the world is on the verge of a great and suspendous crisis, and in comes the name, what does that say? The fourth turning. I want to do a quick review. Last night, we introduced this name to us, this book. Don't forget these two points. We introduced this book to us. Uh, excuse me. What is the fourth turning? Now, you were sleeping. You didn't get it. <laughs> what is the fourth turning? Talk to me, somebody. The fourth turning is a book that were written not by sleeping men, but a book that were written by, guess what? Thinking men. Shall we look at it, yes or no? Why? Based on history. Based on the Bible. Understanding these wise men. Now, here it says, let's read this together. It says, uh, I'll read it to you. It says, a book published nearly what? 25 years ago predicted America would hit a great what? Crisis, climaxing around 2020. Here's a book over 25 years ago talking about this. It says, and that up next is a millennial versus boomer standoff that will usher in a what? New world order. Great crisis in 2008, followed by an even greater one in 2020, as an authoritating, severe, unyielding leader from the baby boomer generation resists, excuse me, a historic moment of change afoot in the U.S., would you believe that this was all predicted almost, what, 25 years ago? And a book champion at the highest levels in the Democratic Party and in the uh, Republican Party, same book, Steve Bannon. Remember, anybody remember Steve Bannon? 
Man, he was talking about this book all the time when he was first brought into office, talking about a blueprint that they were using. Now, my brothers and sisters, it says uh, uh, in the book, Neil and Strauss, the men who wrote the book, who co-wrote several books on generational theory. It says in 1997, they went through and walked through this. It says history is what? Don't forget this. And winter is what? Now, you don't fully understand what they're saying yet. But then they notice what he says. How and Straw saw the climax coming around what? Now, 2020 is no longer present. It's no longer future or prophecy. It's now what? But they saw that history. But guess what? The prophets saw it too. The thinking men saw it, but the prophets saw it. If you were here at camp meeting, did we not tell you about 2020 before it came? Now, my brothers and sisters, it says, the climax around 2020, and, uh, and the, what's the next word? Now, after a climax, we're going to show you what this means. You don't fully understand yet, but we're going to show you what it means. But after a climax or a crisis, historically, there's always something called a resolution or a reset. A resolution or a what? And that means what that does, it takes us out of the crisis and makes everything go back to normal. I'm going to show you something historically. Now, watch by the grace of God. It says, uh, a resolution including a great devaluation as the economy is entirely what? Now, does the Bible tell us anything about a restructuring that no man would be able to what? Buy or sell, save he that have the mark of the beast. A restructuring of the entire economy. Now, watch what it says. It says, it says, as the economy is restructured for a new set of circumstances around what? This is what the book, he's talking about what the book said. The thinking men. What were they looking at? What evidence did they have? What did they see? We need to line them up with the prophets to see if what they saw is biblical. Now, my brothers and my sisters, it tells us this. And remember, it said history is seasonal. Sometime before 2025, they wrote, America will pass through a great gate in what? History. And the very survival of the nation will feel at stake. Now, have we ever been told that there's going to be a survival of the United States of America at the end of time and that it's going to look like America is going to fall to our knees with moral degradation, environmental devastation, uh, great crisis of disease everywhere? Did we ever hear that, yes or no? Bible and the Spirit prophecy. What would be the reset? What would be the resolution? What would be the solution? National Sunday Law. So, my brothers and sisters, we've got to put the pieces together and understand what this is talking about. First, let's notice. What did they write before the fourth turning? What got their attention before the fourth turning? It says, the theory sounds outlandish, but the book had a predecessor. What does predecessor mean? It came what? So there's another book. Before you can really get into fourth turning, there's another book called what? Well, we don't have to worry about that. The prophets don't talk about that, do they? Do they? Let's, let's, let's do it. We saw the thinking men. The thinking men, first, they wrote a book about generations. Let's see what the Bible says. Go to Matthew. What book did I say? Matthew 24. Look at Matthew 24 and notice Jesus. Now, and I want you to notice, we're going to look very carefully at Scripture and compare them together and see if we can come to an understanding of something. Now, if you see for the next few minutes what we're going to study, if I were you, I would write it down. Because if you don't, and it doesn't get into your brain, and you don't make the right decision, it will come back to you when it's too late, and you will say, I wish I had listened then. But it will be too late then. Now it's not too late. Now watch. Understanding for ourselves. Understand. Matthew 24. Matthew 24, beginning in verse 3. You remember Jesus. He was on the Mount of Olives talking to his disciples, closing his ministry. Verse 3. Let's read this together. Very familiar text. Often quoted, but never too often. Verse 3. Let's read it together. It says, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him how? You know that this is what Jesus was talking about, not just in public. Jesus was talking about this privately. Can you imagine if you had overheard Jesus talking privately, he wouldn't have been talking about that girl or that guy or that man. He would have been saying, Jesus. Jesus would have been saying, a crisis is at hand. Get ready. It says, privately they came to him. And look what it says in Matthew 24. It says, tell us, when shall these things be? Time. And what shall be the sign, events, of thy coming and of the, talk to me somebody, and of the what? So they asked Jesus about something that is very stupendous. What are they asking Jesus about? Talk to me somebody. I can't hear you. What are you talking about? What did they ask Jesus about? About the what? They asked him about the end of the world. Jesus said, well, you can't know because uh, you will be a time setter. Is that what he said? 
he began to show them some things. Now, I want you to watch as we look together at what he showed us. Very intelligent. Now, he showed many things. I'm not going to go through that. Last year, we talked about where the pandemic fit into that. That's not where I'm going right now. Jump to verse 32 for a moment, and notice what it says in verse 32. Look at verse 32, and notice what the Bible says in verse 32 in explaining not only the wars, rumors of wars, environmental devastation, but in verse 32, he says something. In verse 32, it says, let's read it carefully, because you're going to see that every word is important when you study. Look at what it says in verse 2. Let's read it together. It says, now learn a what? Parable of the... Stop. Don't let that pass by you. What? Why did he say that? They asked him about the end of the world. They didn't ask him about a fig tree. Can you imagine if you were talking to Jesus? Sometimes you would think Jesus is not answering your question. Jesus, when is there going to be an end of the world? Well, did you see that fig tree over there? It's amazing sometimes that we're not fully together. Listen, watch. They asked Jesus about the end of the world, and Jesus pointed them to what? He pointed them to what? Where is the fig tree a part of? What is the fig tree a part of? So in order to understand the end of the world, we've got to look at what? Nature. Why do you think he moved us from the city to the country in the final generation? So that we can see, guess what? Nature. Do you know we're told that minds that have been amused and abused by fiction, minds that have been amused and abused by entertainment, that in nature that the brain cells are rebuilt. The affections are changed. Relationship with God becomes more desirable. Now, my brothers and my sisters, the devil wants to keep us out of this, but Jesus said, if you want to understand the end of the world, go to nature. Now, watch what he wants you to know about nature. Watch what he says. Now, learn the parable of the fig tree when his branch is yet tender and put it forth what? He's showing them outward evidence, and he says, Lees, you don't guess. This is intelligent understanding. You don't guess. You what? You know that summer is nigh or near. Now, notice what Jesus did. He said, look, I want to, you say, when, how can I know the end of the world is here? He said, I'm going to give you some evidence that is undisputable. Fact. But in order to understand this, we must first look at what? Nature. Then he brought up nature and he said, if you see the leaves on a particular tree, fig tree, that if it gets cold, what happens to the leaves on a fig tree? What, gets, what happens to the leaves? They fall off. But when it gets warm and, and, and something happens, what happens back to the leaves when the season changes? What happens to the leaves? They come back on. Now, have you ever seen leaves go off a tree, yes or no? Have you ever seen leaves come back on the tree? Now, when the leaves come back on the tree, do you go to your neighbor and knock on his door? <laughs> neighbor! I saw some leaves on my tree. What does it mean, neighbor? What does it mean? Do you do that? You know that when the leaves come back on the tree, the season has changed. Am I right? He said, when you see the leaves, you know that what? Summer is what? I want to ask you a question. They asked him about the end of the world, but he said, if you want to know the end of the world, you have to look at what? So in order to understand the history of the world, you've got to look at nature to understand the history of the world. And in order to understand the history of the world by nature, you've got to look at summer. But what is summer? So what he is telling us is that in order to understand the history of the world, we have to understand nature and as it relates to seasons, that we will understand when the end of the world is coming by understanding the seasons of nature. Are you with me, yes or no? Look at what he says, verse 32. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When the branches yet tender, you put up a leaves, you know the summer's lie. Verse 33, so likewise ye. When you shall, not vis invisible, but visible, when you shall what? See. How much? All these things, don't guess, but what? Know that it is near, even where? At the doors. What do you mean that we can look at nature, look at the seasons, and know that the coming of Christ was at the door? What do you mean? Verse 34. It says, what's the first word? What does verily mean? You know, of a certainty, of a truth. In other words, if you don't understand, let me make it very plain. He said, if you want to know how much of we can know about the end of the world, he said you can know not the day and the hour. He told us we couldn't know that. 
But he said, you can't know the season. In fact, in verse 34, it says, Verily of a truth I say unto you. What's the next two words? Stop. This what? This generation shall not pass till what? Now, what type of generation is that that's not passing until all these things to be fulfilled? The last which of which is the end of the world. What type of generation? First generation or la- limit generation? First generation or last generation? First generation or final generation? So Jesus said, while we may not know the day and hour before probation closes, we can understand the generation by understanding what? The seasons of nature. Now, my brothers and sisters, in nature, nature only has four seasons. What are the four seasons in nature? Spring. I can't hear you. Would you say this with me? Very simple. What's the first season? Spring. What's the second season? That's the one Jesus specifically pointed to. Summer. What's the third season? Fall. What's the fourth season? Winter. The Bible is telling us, in order to understand in the world, if you look at nature, we understand seasons, there's something about these seasons that will outline the history of this world for us by looking at the seasons. Now, and he said, if you study it properly, you will understand the word. Talk to me. You will understand the word. I can't hear. I heard one man. Thank you. You understand what? Now, you understand what the? Now, my brothers and sisters, I want to ask you a question. What did the thinking men say? What did they study first? They studied what? Now, their study of generations led them to a study of the seasons. Watch. Watch what it says. It says, in, ni- in the 1990s, William Strawson Hall published two great books. First was what? Generation. Second was The Fourth Turning, which set out a bold and fascinating theory that the generations of what? History change in a regular cycle, just like the seasons of the year. They said, just as you study the Bible. Well, they didn't say the Bible. I'm I'm, I'm telling you the Bible. They said, when you study nature, there are seasons. When you study history, they noticed that the generations had a similar similar season, just like this. And Jesus said the same thing. Jesus said, if you want to understand the generations, you've got to study the seasons. How many generations? Well, how many seasons? And then what happens after the fourth season? It starts over again. Spring, summer, fall. It doesn't happen in any order or in that order. Everything will take place in this order. Do you know that you'll never get winter before you get spring? Never. Spring, summer, fall, winter. It says that the ancient, it says, uh, 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 just like the seasons of the year, that the ancients were on, uh, on to something with their, what type of view? Cyclical view of time. Strauss argue that the last, what, five centuries of Anglo-American history can be explained by the existence of the four generational archetypes for these seasons as well. Now, my brother and sister, what he's telling us, these men studied history, and they went through the last uh, 500 years. You'll find out some men actually went from the time of the 1400s all the way through, and they found out that you can identify all of those years from 1400 to today under these same four seasons, and they noticed something that was very interesting. This is what the book says. Let's read this together. It says, this book builds on the theory that history is cyclical. Repeating after four, hence the name, the four turning. It says, each lasting, how long? Now, I'm going to come back to that because, remember, if we're going to follow what Jesus did and be right, we have to look at what the thinking men say, and then we need to go to the prophets. And if they say the same thing, this generation shall not pass. The same that brought the first coming will be the same information that brings us to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Let's watch. So it says, the first turn is the what? Now, notice they're looking at generation. They say that in the spring, which is the first turn, in type of the spring, something happens in a generation. There's always a what? High, you know, like in nature. Uh, after the winter, the leaves have fallen off, everything is gone, and then you will begin to start recognizing that when the leaves fall off, everything is gone. There has to come a time after it's reset, spring comes back, and then everything's like it's on a high. It begins to grow. Your grass grows very high. Am I right? And if you don't, and if you don't have any country land with some acres, you, you'll find out that when that grass grows, it grows. Am I right? You don't cut it for two weeks. 
You don't cut the grass for two weeks. It's not like in the city. You don't cut the grass for two weeks. You know, neighbor might get mad at you. But in the country, you don't cut the grass for two weeks. You won't even be able to find your, your wife. <laughs> I mean, you go through that thing. You. But there's a high. There's a high. It says the first turn is the high. A period of what? Relief after a crisis has ended. The second turning is a what? So after the high, the second turning is an awakening. This corresponds to the summer. An awakening starts to take place. Things that were sleeping wake up. It says when people start to get back to reality after the what? But then there comes the third turning. And the third turning is not a high or an awakening. What is the third turning? It is a what? Unraveling. Then it says, in which people are unhappy with the way things were in the previous two turnings, and now becoming pessimistic about the future, and then it brings us to the final, or the fourth turning, and finally, the fourth turning is a what? Crisis. I wonder if that sounds familiar. Crisis. When is that crisis? It says, finally, crisis, some unexpected major event that will involve how much? everyone, and completely change the way people think from before the crisis. Now, what event do we know that's going to come in a crisis that's going to completely change the way everybody thinks? What event? What event? Talk to me, somebody. You better watch this. You better watch this. You see, they don't know what it is, but they understand what has happened in history. God needs some seven evidence. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that a, a, a historian who doesn't even believe the Bible will write this down? What would happen if he heard the third angel's message? He would sit down and see that everything he thought was in the Bible, but then explain it to him in more clear terms than he ever saw. Now, my brothers and sisters, it says, think before the crisis occurred to after it ends, then the cycle does what? Begins again with a what? There's a reset, in other words. It starts over, and then it kept happening. Now, the world thinks that this is going to happen again and again and again and again and again and again and again, and that there's really no end to it. But guess what we know when we study the Bible? There is a limit. Now imagine, you take this cycle and then you come to America. Why America? Why are we interested in watching the cycle in America? Because we know that's the last nation in prophecy. If we see it happen there and bring us to the final crisis, we know what the event is. A national Sunday law. Now, let's follow and see if we can understand what's actually taking place. Let's put it in. Now, look what it says. Let's see if we can find out what's actually taking place. They say that the most recent unraveling in the U.S. began in the what? We'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. 2020 and the fourth turning. Why this year could be an important what? Now, here in 2020, this article was written in 2020, and they're talking about it in September. This could be the year. Now, what made them say that? Because some of them dug up the book, The Fourth Turning, that was written many years before that. And they said, this may be the year of The Fourth Turning. And they began to start seeing what was going on. Now, watch. Watch what they say. Historically, The Fourth Turning of each Cyclicum, that's the, 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 the name that the Romans gave uh, to this time frame, has culminated in a major what? Which brings great destruction, but also an opportunity to what? Now watch what they're talking about now. Start over again. Reset. It says, the authors also detail a series of related, relating to Anglo-American history going back to the what? 15th century. Historically, the fourth turnings has culminated in a what? So now watch what it's saying. Every time these fourth turning repeats itself, at the end of the fourth turning, there's always a major crisis that brings a, a, some type of a, a, a significant event like a war. And it starts talking about it uh, going through. After the uh, first turning that took place in America when it declared our independence, the first turning took us to the American War of Independence in 1776 to 1783 when we go through these turnings historically. It says, which culminated in the birth of the U.S., the next group of fourth turnings took us, what happened in the crisis of the second fourth turning? The American what? Civil War of 1861, 1865, which ended in slavery in the southern states. Then, then after that, 
The fourth turning goes again. We go through the same seasons. We come back to the fourth turning. And what is the next fourth turning? The second world war of what? 1939 to what? 1945, in which the Axis powers did what? Were defeated. Now, I want to show you something. Now, I'm going to show you this in just a minute. Here's 1945 which is supposed to be the time when everything resets itself. And you'll notice that's when the United Nations were formed in 1946, which was a reset to bring peace among all the nations, to bring all the world together. But let's look at 1945 for a moment. Now, when actually, how long between 1945 and 2025? How many years? Anybody know how many years? 80 years. So if the last fourth turning... Took us in 1945, and we're going to show you this, all, the, the, the entire type takes 80 years. In fact, we're going to show you that they say that every one of these turnings historically represent 20 years. 20 years here, 20 years here, 20 years here, 20 years here. Now, if I get 20, 40, 60, what do I get? 80. So then, when can I expect to see the next fourth crisis around what year? 2025. Now, watch as we start going through. They didn't just start making this up. They went back to the 1500s, and every time, historically, without fail, because history is cyclical. As it hath been, so shall it be. There's nothing new under the sun. Now, watch what this says. It says, as the authors detail this, it says, each of these wars culminated of a period of great upheaval and discontent among the people towards their governments. As it ended, it made them go against the government. It started a revolution. Look what it says, a 2021 look at the what? I think we need to do that. What do you say? Do you want some more? Yes or no? Look, here is client first capital. Here's a bank. This is a bank talking about the fourth turning. In 1997, Neil Howe and William Strauss published their fourth turning, which goes into detail on history, which moves in what? 80-year cycles, and each one is divided into periods defined by each what? Generation. So they're looking at the generations, and they're noticing that every 20 years, something happens. Now, my brothers and sisters, at the end of the cycle, or the crisis phase, is also known as the what? So the fourth turning always brings us to a crisis. The fourth turning always brings us to a what? Crisis. All right. Here it is. Bring us to a crisis. Here's a man. This was a retired Navy uh, commander of the retired assistant and vice president. Here's the uh, uh, Roanoke Times in Virginia. It says, Hall, we're not waiting for it. We're what? In the fourth turn. What's he talking about? Let's see. Picture America as a pseudo iceberg floating in the ocean. 25% of the iceberg is what? Now, I want you to understand what he's saying before we finish reading. Why did he use 25%? Why did he say 25%? 25% is a fourth. So in order to get 100%, I need how many 25s? Four. Now watch. So he says 25% is, a, 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 is above water. This represents our society, our family, our what? Our life, and, and we know it well. The other 75% of the iceberg, though, is where? Where? We don't see that. Then it says every 80 years or so, plus or minus, a crisis occurs. The iceberg becomes unstable and does what? Rotates. Our current 25% rolls into the water and a new 25% surfaces. We adapt to a whole new America. The crisis is called a fourth turning. And we are beginning one when? Right now. This is present truth. It says in the late 1980s, William Straw, prominent scholars, and what were they major? What were they scholars in? In what? Now, if they were scholars, what does it tell us? What type of men are where they talk to me? Thinking men. It says they were scholars in what? History. What else? Economy. What else? Law, government, politics. It says began research examining what? Generations from what time? From 1730 all the way into 2050, looking at its projection. And the influence each had on our social, economic, and governmental functions. The book Generations outlines the result of their what? which was published in 1991. In 1997, after studying all that, they began to understand something by looking at all these generations for hundreds of years. 
They published the second book, The Fourth Turning, a profound reflection on trends in America and a prediction of what we might see as future generations progress through what? History. Based on what happened in the past. Now, my brothers and sisters, this becomes very important. It says, every what? They're about the older generation. Now, now they're basing the concept that a life, they're basing the concept of 24 to 60, 80, that, they are, that a life before it changes, has 80 years. Now, what I want to do, let's test it. That's what the thinking men say. Now, where do we need to go? Talk to me. Where do we need to go? To the prophet. What does the prophet say? Go to Psalms 90. Go to Psalms 90. Let's test. Let's test everything they say to launch the testimony. Are you with me, yes or no? Am I going too fast? Praise God. We're doing good tonight. Very praise God. Go to, look at Psalms 90. I better speed up because you said that too fast. Let me go fast. Okay, let's, here we go. Then Psalm 90. You in Psalms 90? Let's look at Psalms 90, the 90 division. Notice what the Bible says in Psalms 90, and let's pick up in verse 10, and let's watch the prophets. Watch. I'm telling you something. If you understand this, it will open up your eyes and my eyes, and we will see if ever there was a time to make the exodus is now as we pray for an understanding of the time and what to do in this time. Look what the Bible says in Psalms 90, beginning in verse 10. Uh, Psalms 90, verse 10. Are you there? Amen. Let's read it together. What does the Bible say? It says, the days of our years are three score years. Question, what is a score? 20. Does that sound familiar? How much is three score? 60. What is three score and 10? 70. Someone says, well, it doesn't line up. We better throw it away. No, no, no. Keep reading the Bible. It says three score and 10. Then go on. It says, and if by reason of strength they be, talk to me somebody, four score years, talk to me, 40, uh, 80 years broken up into 20-year periods. Are the prophets right? Are the thinking men right? Were they right at the first coming? Are they right at the second coming? You better hold on. You want some more? Now let's go a little further. Now, my brothers and sisters, we looked and we see it, everything they're saying right so far. Every 20 years or thereabout, the oldest generation dies off. Someone says, but I thought in the Bible a generation is 40 years. It is, but you will find out that biblically, a person does not affect the generation into a 20-year time frame. So even though a generation is there, it does not move the generation into 20 years. Let me show you that from the Bible. Go to Numbers chapter 1. I remember when my teacher showed me this. I'm telling you, my brothers and sisters, when a man can teach truth from the Bible and be dead and the truth still be taught and is the same, you know that a man of God was among us. Now, my brothers and sisters, I remember we were flying somewhere on a plane. And I tell you, my teacher, he always had his Bible with him. I don't care what, I mean, if he left let that Bible, I remember one time we were on a plane, the, the, he left his Bible in, inside the plane. When he left it there, all of a sudden he recognized me, and I said, wait, my Bible's not with me now. And they said, well, you can't get back on the plane, sir. You know what he did? He walked right by them. <laughs> Mother Mason, am I telling you the truth? The man walked right by them. They said, you can't do it. He was already gone. <laughs> Came back with his Bible. He said, no, I got to have this. He did not go without that Bible. He taught me to love the Bible, to enjoy the Bible, to read the Bible, and he taught me to study by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God, my friends. This is how Jesus taught. Now, look what it says. Every 20 years. Now, go to Numbers chapter 1. I remember he was telling me, he read something that day before he left it. He said to me, he said, Brother Davis, do you see this? And we, he, he went to Ezra. He had been studying all through the Bible. He went to Ezra, and he said, look, every 20 years, the nation, every 20 years that the, a group of people are affected, and I looked at it and said, man, I never saw an Ezra like that. And we looked at Ezra, but we're not going to Ezra now. Look at the book of Numbers. The reason why we're going to the book of Numbers is because we're talking about Numbers. Numbers takes us through the Exodus into the Promised Land. Let's go to the book of Numbers. What should we expect to see in the book of Numbers? Numbers. Isn't that simple? <laughs> Now, look at the Bible. Someone said, well, you can't teach children. Do you know that, brothers and sisters, the Bible is the greatest book in the universe? Greatest Bible book, greatest math book, greatest history book, greatest science book. It's amazing. When you go to school, you know, you see people, they come and they have all their books and they load it down. I mean, they can't even move. They're loaded down. Not, not, not yet, not yet, not yet. They, they load it down and they're moving as they go through. They're, they're moving through and just. But do you know that in true education, you only need one book? <laughs> can you imagine walking freely? It's better than all those books, all books combined. Now, look at what it says. Look at what the Bible says in the book of Numbers chapter 1. Look at Numbers chapter 1, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. 
Numbers chapter 1, notice what the Bible says in the book of Numbers, the first chapter. Look at what it says in Numbers 1, beginning in verse 3. Look at Numbers 1, verse 3. Numbers 1 and verse 3. The Bible says, speaking of Numbers, it says, let's, let's start in verse 1. Verse 1. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, and the tabernacle of the congregation on the first day of the second month, and the second year after they were come, what? That's the Exodus. Out of the land of Egypt, saying, verse 2, Take ye the sum of all the congregation of the children of Israel. All their, what? Because they went in the Exodus by families. It says, by the house of their fathers, with the number of their names, every male by their poles. And God had armies set up. But you'll notice that everybody did not get numbered because they all didn't affect the families or the nations yet. Look at verse 3. The Bible says in verse 3, it says, from what? 20 years old and upward, all they that are able to go forth to war in Israel. So what time frame were they able to affect political or religious influence in a nation or denomination? 20 years. So although a generation is 40 years, the effect comes every what? When they come to at least 20. 20 years. You can go all down to the Bible and you'll see the same thing. If you were to jump down and look at verse 22. Last line says, every male from 20 years old and upward. If you look at 24, you can go through the whole chapters and see 20-year increments. It means something very significant. And then it says that they come every 20 years. They're about, the older generation dies, and a new generation moves up unto elderhood. And the fourth turning is an era in which Americans' institutional life is what? Torn down. Rebuilt from the ground up. Always in response to a perceived threat to the nation's very what? It says the fourth turning is a crisis. It occurs about every, what, 80 years, a, a period equivalent to the average, what? Is that in the Bible, yes or no? It says, and a complete turnover of all four generations, and it says, we are entering into such a crisis when? Right now. Now, my brothers and sisters, America's first fourth turning took us to the start of the a nation called America. The second fourth turning took us to the Civil War. The third fourth turning took us to 1945. So then the last fourth turning takes us to 2025. The fourth fourth turning. The fourth fourth turning. The what? The fourth fourth turning. I want to close right here because I can see my time is gone. The book of Amos, chapter 1. I want to show you something as we conclude. In the book of Amos, chapter 1. In the book of Amos, chapter 1. Notice what the Bible says in Amos, chapter 1. And I want to show you something very interesting that happens to a nation and a denomination. In Amos, chapter 1. And remember, the last fourth turning, 1945. Third fourth turning. Here's the fourth fourth turning. Now, in the book of Amos, chapter 1. Notice what the Bible says in Amos, chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. Amos chapter 1, verse 3, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. We're testing the prophets. Now notice what it says in verse 3. It says, thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of what? Damascus, and for four, I will not what? Turn away the punishment thereof, because they have threshed Gilead. In other words, I will allow three, but when it comes to four, that's the limit. At four, judgment comes upon the fourth. So my brothers and sisters, I want you to see something. Go down to verse 6, Amos 1 verse 6. It says, thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza, and for four, I will not Turn away the punishment thereof. In other words, God in his mercy will withhold punishment three times, but not the fourth. It says to Gaza, now watch, verse uh, 9, verse 9. It says, thus said the Lord, for three transgression of Tyre, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment where? There. Now I want to ask you a question. Do you know what's happening? We don't have time to go through verse by verse, but it continues to go down the chapter again and again and again. But if you were to look at a map, guess what would happen? You would see that Jerusalem was in the middle, and what was happening is that God was looking at all the surrounding nations and telling them, all those nations were surrounding Israel. And all those nations were telling them, three, I will allow, but the fourth, no more. That's it. That was the nation. But then in Amos chapter 2, 
the prophet doesn't stop at the nations. He says the same limit that will be given to the nation will also be given to, guess what? The denomination. So in Amos chapter 2, notice what happens in verse 4. In verse 4, the Bible says, if you go back to chapter 1 and 2, it begins to talk about Amos and Moab. Moab were the brothers of the family of the remnant church. They came from Lot. If you were in country living, you would know more of what that's talking about in the country living class. Now, in Amos 2 verse 1, the Bible says, thus, uh, verse, Amos 2 verse 4, thus saith the Lord for three transgressions of what? Judah. Who is Judah? Nations now? No. This is the remnant people of God. For three transgressions of Judah and for four I will not turn away my punishment thereof because they have despised the what, everybody? You're going to find that God has a limit to the third and fourth what? Generation. He was merciful. But he holds his guilty to the third and fourth generations. Now I want to ask you a question as we conclude. If this is so with the nation and with the denomination, wouldn't it be interesting to see if there are four turnings, where does the fourth turning, the fourth, fourth turning, the it, what does it bring the nation to? What year? I wonder where the fourth, fourth turning brings the denomination. Guess what year? 2025. Same. So in 2024, it comes to an end, which starts off 2025. Now, my brothers and my sisters, when you study Ezekiel chapter 8, and we'll pick this up tomorrow, guess how many turnings? You remember Ezekiel 8? Remember that? Turn thee yet again. First turning. Go back and read it. Turn thee yet again. Second turning. Turn thee yet again. Third turning. But in Ezekiel 8, guess how many turns? Four and only four. Guess what happened under the fourth turn? They turn their back to the east, uh, to the temple, faced the east, and worshiped the sun under the fourth turning. We're in the fourth turning right now. What must happen in this generation? I'll come back and fill in the gaps. You want me to come back and fill in the gaps? You want me to come back and fill the gaps in? No, I can't keep going. <laughs> I'll come back. Jesus is about to leave the mercy seat. This is the chapter of the seal of God. Because you remember, after the fourth turning of Ezekiel 8, you know what Ezekiel 9 is? The sealing. The ceiling. The mercy seat, he's about to leave. It says to put on garments of vengeance and pour out his wrath and judgment because sentence against an evil at work is not easily executed speedily. Therefore, the heart of the sons of men are fully set in them to do evil. Because God is patient with us, we look at that patience and say, I can do what I want. Instead of letting the patience turn us to repentance. Instead of being softened by the patience and long forbearance that the Lord has exercised toward them, those who fear not God and love not the, 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 uh, the truth, strengthen their hearts in the evil course. But let's read this together. But there are limits, even to the forbearance of God. Therefore, God must interfere and vindicate. Based on Ezekiel 8, where does that limit take us to? Not the third, but to the fourth. Limits. Of the Amorites, saying, the Lord said in the fourth generation, although this nation was conspicuous because of its idolatry and corruption, it had not yet filled up the cup of his iniquity, and God would not give command for its utter destruction. Three I would allow, but fourth, no more. The compassionate creator was willing to bear with the iniquity until what everybody, the fourth generation. Then, if no change was seen for the better, his judgments would fall upon them. My brothers and sisters, that limit takes us to the fourth generation. We're going to find out that this fourth turning, which brings us to that fourth generation, tells us that the time is now. My brothers and sisters, we're going to show tomorrow as we continue that this system of the world is about to collapse. 
And before it does, God must take some families and help us to make a transition and exodus out from where we are as enemies of God to become the friend and friend of God. Out from city living to country living. Out from the system of the world into God's system of living so that by the grace of God, he can have a team that he can put on the field to finish the work, and I want to be a part of that team. What do you say? Our time is gone. And I'm going to tell you something. Those who will not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. If we will not look and let what we read sink into our ears, sink into our heart, sink into our mind, and say, Lord, I cannot go back to life as usual. There has got to be a change, a radical change, an exodus. And in order to make that exodus, I need a man. And the man's name is who? Jesus. You remember what he said in John chapter 8, verse 32, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. What is that truth? Not just intellectual knowledge. In verse 36 it said, and when the Son of Man has made you free, you shall be what? Free and deep. Do you want to be free tonight, yes or no? Free from everything that keeps us from Jesus. Tonight, we must make it up in my mind, whatever it takes, with Jesus with me and before me, I'm not going to be stuck in this crisis. I'm not going to stay in Egypt. I want to go to the promised land. I don't know about you, but I'm going. That's for me and my house. That's what Joshua said on the way to the promise. He said, look, as for me and what? Now, if to you, if it doesn't seem good, that's you. I don't want you to be lost, but I can't force. You can't force me. I can't force you. As for me and... Will you come and go with me? Will you? We can all go as one family. What do you say? This is my desire tonight. We're going to stop right here. Heavenly Father, the handwriting is on the wall. We can see that a crisis is not coming. The crisis is here. We're in the turning, the generation that will see the son in law pass. And Father, as we learn from the cycles of history and seasons and nature, we don't have to ask, we know. And Lord, we're asking that you will do something for us this week that will help us to see how to come in contact with this man named Jesus, that will change our hearts, that will change our families, that will change our lives. And then, Lord, you can put someone on the field that you can use to reach the entire world. We thank you. I pause the prayer. Someone says, Lord, I want this experience. I, I see what you're saying. I want to understand. I want to learn how to make this exodus with my family and my heart and my life so I can help somebody else and get this experience for myself. Just raise your hand wherever you are. You're saying, dear God, I want this experience. I want to believe, dear God. I want to believe. Help now my unbelief. Heavenly Father, you see the lifted hands. Help us to make a decision tonight. No more playing games with God. No more playing with salvation. Now is the accepted time. We thank you, dear God, for all that you have done tonight. Be with those lifted hands, I pray. And lift our hearts. Lift our homes. We thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated for a silent moment of meditation. God has been good to us. Amen. What mercy. What mercy. We're going to break right here. We're going to ask that you have a, we'll have a 30-minute break. We'll come back at 6.35. What time did I say? We're making a little bit of adjustment on the time. We'll come back at 6.35. So please just take a 20-minute break, and we'll come back at 6.35, and we'll begin the last message for today. Not one of us wants to miss it. I believe that if ever there was a time to get ready, it needs to be now. Am I right?
Hebrews says that we should not forsake ourselves together, but so much the more as we see the day what? Not meeting less and less, but meeting how? More and more. So let's take a 20-minute break, stretch, drink water, take the children away, let's pray, and then we'll come back for our last session where we can draw closer to Jesus Christ. May God bless you. You may consider yourself dismissed.